and the deep ties between our governments and our people. As President Rivlin approaches the end of his term, the visit will honor the dedication he has shown to strengthening the friendship between the two countries over the course of many years. On Tuesday, the President will travel to southwest Wisconsin with Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack to talk about growing agriculture, growing agriculture and rural economies. On Wednesday, he will convene cabinet officials, governors from western states, and private sector partners to discuss the devastating in intersection of drought, heat, and wildfires in the western United States and strengthening prevention preparedness and response efforts for this wildfire season, which is already outpacing last season all alone, uh, outpacing last season alone, sorry, the 2020 wildfire season alone burned over 10 million acres across the United States, resulting in the loss of dozens of lives and tens of billions of dollars in economic damage. This meeting will focus on how the federal government can most effectively protect public safety and deliver assistance to our people in times of urgent need. And on Friday, the President will also deliver remarks on the June jobs report. Uh, next week, even while all of this is going on, a busy week, the President will also continue to work and engage closely with members of Congress about moving his agenda forward, uh, whether it's the uh, bipartisan infrastructure agreement just announced yesterday or the budget reconciliation process that's also moving forward. And he will continue to uh, on his work to protect the sacred right to vote. You'll hear from him next week on that. Uh, we're still finalizing the details, and he's been engaged in that work through his career, so you'll hear more from him on that next week. I'd also note, so I don't forget, today is Jerome's last day in the White House briefing room as a White House correspondent, so um, thank you to your service to the public over the last several years. All right, why don't we kick it off, Darlene? Thank you, Jen. Um, is the infrastructure agreement already stuck in a pothole? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. You worked hard on that. No, I, I like it. Uh, absolutely not, uh, in our view. Uh, the president uh, is continuing to, as I said, as he said yesterday, there's work ahead. There's no question about that. But yesterday was a significant moment when you saw Democrats and Republicans and the President of the United States stand outside together and say, we've come to agreement to, pa to work for toward passing a historic investment in infrastructure, one that ha would have, I just have this handy chart up here, I thought someone might ask about this, um, would have key components that would help communities across the country. And I talked with him about this this morning, what he was most excited about, what he's going to continue what his message is going to be as he continues to advocate for this bill moving forward. One is the significant economic impact. It's going to help create millions of good paying union jobs. It will also have a huge impact on low income communities, on communities of color. It will eliminate lead pipes to stop kids from drinking poison water. Flint, Michigan should not be so far away that we don't remember the impact on that community. Uh, this is a Part of this package will help prevent that from ever happening again. It includes the single largest investment in environmental remediation in history. What does that mean? A lot of people at home don't know what that means, so I'm going to explain it. Uh, and it's 100% of what he asked for. It means cleaning up pollution in communities that have disproportionately borne the brunt of environmental pollution. To capping, it also means capping wells where big oil companies left wells uncapped with methane pouring out. Uh, it means putting people back to work to do the work we need to do to help uh, create a clean energy economy for the long term. And it has the largest investment in public transit in our nation's history. We know this will also have an enormous impact on low income communities, many communities of color. I'll also note there are huge components of this package that will help address the climate crisis. One is the first ever, uh, w first ever network, first time we've ever invested, sorry, in a network of EV charging stations across the country. So electric vehicles, I don't currently own one, maybe I will in the future, who knows? Uh, it will make it easier, there will be more charging stations so people can use them across the country. It will have the largest investment in history in a clean energy transmission grid, something that will also help us take a huge step forward. And this bill also will help us, and this is a piece he talked about yesterday, but he's particularly excited about us, make us more competitive in the world. And a specific example there is making sure we are building our battery industry here in the United States to compete globally. So that's the case he's making. Uh, he's going to continue to make. Uh, there's no question there's work ahead, and he's ready to roll up his sleeves and work like hell to get it done. But we're hearing from the Hill from a lot of senators that uh, ha unhappiness over the president's decision to want to do both these packages at the same time, the, the pairing, moving them in tandem. 
uh, when senators agreed to this deal, was the White House up front with them that this was the way the president wanted to proceed? Well, first, you've, you all have heard the president say multiple times publicly that he wanted to, he was going to move these bills forward, wanted to move them forward in parallel paths. And that's exactly what's happening. Uh, that hasn't been a secret. He hasn't said it quietly. He hasn't even whispered it. He said it very much out loud to all of you, as we have said many times from here. I will say that the president's view is that the public, the American people, elected him to not lead on process, but to get things done. Uh, the House and Senate are going to determine, the leaders in the House and Senate are going to determine the sequencing, the timeline, and he looks forward to signing both pieces of legislation. One other quick one. Yeah. What is the plan for, will we get a statement from the president after their uh, Derek Chauvin is sentenced? Uh, do you expect the president will call George Floyd's family, be in touch with them after the sentence is uh, uh, It's announced? a great question, Darlene. I, I don't, I don't have any anticipate, I, I, I don't have anything to preview for you. I guess I should say at this point, we'll wait for the sentencing to come out. As you know, he has a close personal connection with the Floyd family, and certainly I know they and we are all watching this closely. Go ahead. Does the President have any plans to visit Surfside to see the devastation for himself? Well, I would say first that any decision along those lines would be done in coordination and cooperation with local authorities. As you know, and you all have been covering this closely, uh, right now we're in a rescue and recovery phase of this, uh, and there have been frequent updates from local authorities on the ground. So I don't have any uh, trip to preview or predict for you at this point in time. How did the Vice President choose El Paso as the location for her first trip to the border as Vice President? Uh, it's a great question. I was, I was interested in that as well, so we looked into it. Um, I would say uh, that El Paso has um, an interesting history, uh, as you may know, uh, because it was the uh, place where the former president uh, kind of, it was a base place of where he put in place some of his immigration policies that we felt were so problematic. Uh, and so it's a, it's a place that has a little bit of a historical connection in that regard, and it's an opportunity to uh, draw a bit of a contrast with what we're trying to accomplish. Can you give us any details about the three staffers in the vice president's office who are leaving? And what should we take from the fact that you have several key staff who are leaving this early in the administration. I just don't have any more details on the circumstances of their departure. Uh, as you may know, uh, these are uh, sometimes high, high stress jobs, tiring jobs, exhausting jobs, um, and uh, but I don't have anything more specific on their decisions. Go ahead. Following up on Surfside, if I can, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, no details about whether he plans to travel there. Has the president now spoken to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis about the circumstances? We're working to set up a call uh, between the president and the governor that should be happening this afternoon, and we'll give you all a readout of that when it happens. We'll wait for that readout when it happens. The president yesterday spoke about voting rights and what he would be doing. He said, quote, I'll be going around the country making the case. So he announced it. What specifically is he doing? Where is he going? And what is that going to look like? Stay tuned. I don't have any uh, specific visits to announce for you yet, but this is going to be a fight of his presidency. He believes that voting is a fundamental right for the American people. He's going to use every lever at his disposal to, to advocate for that. You'll hear more from him uh, next week as well. The DOJ announcement today that they would be um, filing this lawsuit against Georgia, given what's going on with their election law there. Did the White House play a role in that? Did the President consult anybody? Does he have any thought on it? Uh, we did not. Um, that was a that was an announcement they made uh, on their own. Uh, but it certainly is consistent with the president's commitment to the administration and the guidance he's given publicly and directly to use every lever at our disposal to ensure we are protecting the fundamental right to vote across the country. Go ahead. So on the timing of when the president's going to get out and advocate for voting rights, I mean, how soon can we see this? We were hearing everyone from the Department of Justice to activists saying that this is a really urgent issue. So how soon can we expect this? Well, the president's going to speak to all of you and to the public next week about uh, his continuing commitment to voting rights, uh, expanding access to voting rights, something that he's worked on for decades through his public career. And I expect to have more to say then. And if you could just uh, follow up and maybe clarify when the president's talking about uh, doing these two pieces of legislation in tandem. Is he going to wait for both of them to land on his desk? Uh, what, what exactly is the timeline here? How, how, how does this play out? Well, again, uh, he believes uh, the American people elected him to uh, lead on getting results, to put out bold ideas to the public. That's exactly what he's done. And we're going to leave it to leaders in Congress to determine the sequencing and the timeline for those pieces moving forward. But he's going to uh, use every lever at his disposal. He's going to be involved. He's going to roll up his sleeves. He's going to work like hell to get these both of these pieces of legislation done. What, what, what does that really look like? Because he says that he's 
if one doesn't come to him, he's not going to sign the other. So is he going to wait for both of them to land on his desk before signing the bipartisan package, waiting for the reconciliation package to come through? He fully expects, hopes, plans to sign both into law, uh, and he uh, will leave it to leaders in Congress to determine the timeline and the sequencing. Go ahead. So just to follow up both on that and, and Darlene's question, the issue Republicans seem to be having is on that specific issue. I won't sign it if the other one isn't on my desk. And I think that's what has them <coughs> frazzled, perhaps would be the word right now, um, an eloquent one. So uh, uh, digging in on that, if leadership decides to send you the bipartisan bill, but the reconciliation bill is not done yet, the president said yesterday, I won't sign it. And that is the White House position on it? Well, let me just take a step back here, because I think the American people are quite focused on how we're getting work done on their behalf less focused on the mechanics of the process. Now, it is up to Republicans, uh, many of whom are the ones who have conveyed that, I, I think, if I'm accurate here, to decide if they are going to vote against a historic investment in infrastructure that's going to rebuild roads and railways and bridge w bridges in their communities simply because they don't like the mechanics of the process. That's a pretty absurd argument for them to make. Good luck on the political front on that argument. Uh, so the president's going to continue to advocate, educate, convey to everyone directly why this needs to move forward. And he stands, he plans to stand exactly by the commitment he made uh, yesterday to them, and he expects they'll do the same. And uh, just two more quick ones. You guys just released a readout with a call with Senator Senator yeah. Martin, one of the lead negotiators. In that readout, the President was reiterating pretty much all of the things he said when he was standing with the Senators. Mm -hmm. Was there a need for the President to reassure Senator Sinema, or was that just a normal schedule call? I think it's just a reflection of the President's commitment to stay very engaged. Yesterday was not the end. I know none of you thought that, but just to be clear, there's work ahead. Senator Sinema uh, is an, was an important leader and partner on this effort to get this bipartisan bill passed. He also reiterated in that call his desire and his commitment and interest in getting a reconciliation bill passed that has a lot of his key priorities, whether it's extending the child tax credit, making universal pre-K a reality, or community college a reality for kids across the country. So it's ongoing engagement. He's looking forward to signing both bills into law. Uh, Are Republicans expected to be so enamored with the idea of sending perhaps billions of dollars into the hinterland that they're going to be willing, you need five more Republicans obviously, that they're going to be willing to accept this two-track approach and sort of look the other way when the express train comes through on the reconciliation idea. Are they, you're, you're sounding as though you expect at least five more Republicans to be so in, enamored with the idea of sending out these billions of dollars to their the constituencies, if you will. Sure. Well, that's exactly what they're doing. This bill would, again, be a historic investment on our nation's infrastructure, the largest investment in public transit in history, the largest in, uh, in since the founding of Amtrak. And as I've noted, it would expand broadband access. That's not exactly a partisan issue. It would rebuild roads and railways and bridges in people's communities, including Republicans. So yes, we fully expect the American people support this. We fully expect and hope we'll have the votes to get it forward. At least five. <laughs> At least five. Okay. Well, five stood uh, stood there yesterday and announced uh -huh. their support for it. And it is now the job of, of the Democratic caucus and the Republican caucus to bo go back and make the case to their uh, their uh, other colleagues. Exactly. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jen. House Budget Committee Chairman John Yarmuth said he doesn't think it's realistic to fully pay for this broader reconciliation package that contains some of the President's other domestic priorities that you just laid out. Senator Manchin also said he doesn't think the country can take on that much more debt. So does the White House still believe that both the infrastructure compromise and this other reconciliation package need to be fully paid for? The President's proposed uh, a number of ways to pay for these packages. Obviously, there was agreement already on the pay-fors for the infrastructure bipartisan deal, which was agreed to by the five Democrats and the five Republicans who stood outside with the President just yesterday. And the President also believes that raising the corporate rate back to where it was the first year of the George W. Bush administration, making asking individuals, the top 1% of Americans, to pay more, to pay for these historic investments, to pay for an extension of the child tax credit to make sure kids have access to universal pre-k is something that we should do because it's right the right policy it will also uh, it's also going to uh, help move our country forward and just one 
One quick question on Afghanistan. Uh, can the president declare a true end to the war if the U.S. is planning to keep 650 troops in the country to provide diplomatic security, as well as several hundred additional troops uh, to maintain security at the Kabul airport? Well, again, I would say the president was clear from the beginning that we uh, anticipated and planned to have a diplomatic presence on the ground, and so he's doing exactly that. Can I follow up on that, Jim? Sure. Uh, on Afghanistan, and then I have a follow up on something else, but on Afghanistan, if we're keeping people there, what's the contingency if, in fact, the Taliban takes over the country? Do you have a contingency? Does the administration have a contingency for that? In what regard? Well, what will for you the do? safety of our of well, our men and women serving in Kabul, or I understand the safety of our people, but what about the safety of the country? We've been there for X amount of years. Are we going to reinvest more people if that's the case? Will there be boots on the ground? What exactly are is this administration looking at if that country falls to the Taliban? Well, well, here's I think what's important to note, Brian. When the president made this announcement, he was very clear that if we did not pull our troops, withdraw our troops from from Afghanistan, something that he has long talked about uh, having an interest and a desire to do, the Taliban would have been shooting at U.S. troops again on May 1st. That's a decision he had to make as president. So the withdrawal deadline uh, negotiated because of the de withdrawal deadline negotiated, I should say, by the prior administration. So his fundamental belief is that after 20 years, it's time to bring our troops home. We're doing that in a time